For a thousand years, kings and queens of Europe had absolute power. But absolute power corrupts absolutely. Greed, revenge, sex, madness, witchcraft, murder. Every monarch had their royal secrets. Throughout history, monarchs held the terrifying power to make war. Their exploits could win glory in battle or bring defeat and destruction to their kingdoms. Three such royals loved war. Prussian King Frederick the Great, his father Frederick William, and Richard the Lionheart of England. They have been remembered as warrior kings because they were warmongers. King Richard the Lionheart has always been depicted as a hero in the legend of Robin Hood. This story describes King Richard as a chivalrous Christian warrior whose bravery in battle earned him the name Lionheart. But the real Richard I was a bloodthirsty killer who slaughtered thousands of people including innocent women and children. A contemporary observer called Richard a bad son, a bad husband, a selfish ruler, and a vicious man. Richard's love of killing and war found an outlet in the Crusades of the 12th century. Since Christian forces captured Jerusalem from the Muslims in the First Crusade, the Holy Land had been in a state of war. The code of chivalry of the time dictated that nobles and knights should defend the Christian world against the infidel. After Richard became King of England in 1189, he had the power to satisfy his bloodlust. Although Richard was King of England, he'd been born and raised in France and was more French than English. He thought England uncivilized and unfriendly. But hungering for war and glory, Richard needed to raise money for a crusader army to fight the infidel. He began to sell off England. An observer noted, He put up for sale everything he had. Offices, lordships, earldoms, sheriffdoms, castles, towns, lands, the lot. Richard's own royal treasurer had to buy his position for the huge amount of £3,000, or $1.8 million today. King Richard reputedly said he would even sell off his own capital, London, if he could find a buyer. Once he had bled England dry to raise money, Richard and his army left for the Holy Land to fight the Muslims. He joined forces with his French countrymen and added mercenaries, assembling the greatest fighting machine in the world at the time. The journey to the Holy Land was long and arduous. Richard and his army marched for six months just to get to the island of Sicily, an essential resting place for weary crusaders. Sicily was a friendly state ruled by Richard's distant relative, King Tancred. An incident involving a treasured falcon revealed King Richard's vicious nature during his stay in Sicily. In the Middle Ages, falcons were considered valuable possessions for sport. Richard stole one of the prize birds from a Sicilian noble. But when the owner asked for the bird's return, Richard was ready to kill the noble. Tancred had to intervene to save the man's life. Richard's army grew restless and unruly. 
In an outbreak of drunken hostility, the Crusaders laid siege to Sicily's capital city, Messina. Boulders were shot out of catapults, killing several people. The army pillaged, looted and burned for weeks before the rampage ended. King Tancred was incensed. Realizing he had offended Tancred and needing to stop in Sicily on his return journey, Richard made amends by presenting the Sicilian king with a beautiful sword. It was reputed to be the famed Excalibur, King Arthur's legendary weapon. If it really was Excalibur, it was a priceless English treasure. But Richard didn't care. To him, it was just another sword. Richard and his army left Sicily and sailed eastward across the Mediterranean, headed for war. The bloodthirsty king had his first taste of killing before even stepping on enemy soil. As the fleet neared the Holy Land, Richard spotted a becalmed Muslim warship. A crusader dived beneath the ship and drilled holes in its hull. Water poured in and 1,400 Muslim sailors jumped from the sinking ship. Richard took the survivors prisoner and then ordered them drowned. His ship was surrounded by bloated bodies. Richard and his army then sailed into the port of Acre. A chronicler wrote, The shore resounded to clarion calls, the braying of trumpets, and the fearful din of horns, exciting the Christians to fight and striking fear into the hearts of the besieged Saracens, announcing the arrival of a great prince. Richard entered the port of Acre in triumph on the 8th of June, 1191, and his army surrounded the enemy garrison. The outnumbered Muslims negotiated a surrender. The terms were simple. Saladin, the leader of the Muslim army, would hand over 1,500 Christian prisoners and return a sacred relic, part of Jesus' true cross, which Saladin was said to have seized. In return, Richard would allow the Muslims to leave unmolested. Saladin released the Christian captives, but the Muslim leader did not produce the holy relic quickly enough for Richard. Secretly, Richard never had any intention of letting the Muslims go free. Slaughtering chained prisoners was easier than facing them in battle later. Claiming treachery, Richard unleashed a bloodbath. The Muslims were taken one by one from the castle and beheaded. For three days, a steady stream of prisoners were marched to their deaths in a blood-soaked field. 2,600 Muslim soldiers their wives and their children were put to death on the orders of Richard the Lionheart. In the end, Richard's mass executions did nothing to help the Crusaders to win a war that was to last another hundred years. Richard and his army were locked in a military stalemate and were forced to turn back towards home. On the way, King Richard and an armed escort of several knights were taken hostage for ransom in Austria. Their captors demanded more money than England had in its treasury. Richard's brother John, ruling in Richard's absence, had to increase taxes to pay for his release. It took almost three years to raise the money. This act of brotherly loyalty made King John one of the most unpopular monarchs in English history. After his release, Richard made his way back to France. He was never to return to England. Pursuing his love of war, Richard was inspecting a siege at Chaloux in 1199, when a 14-year-old boy took a shot at him with a crossbow, lightly wounding him in the shoulder. Richard shrugged off the incident, but the wound got infected. Two weeks later, the fearsome and bloodthirsty King Richard the Lionheart, who claimed to be of a rank which recognizes no superior but God, died not in battle, but in his own bed, suffering an agonizing death from gangrene.
500 years later in northern Germany, King Frederick William of Prussia became one of the great warmongers of Europe. He laid the foundations of modern warfare and built a fearsome war machine, but never used it. It was left to his son, Frederick the Great, to put theory into practice and exercise the military might his father bequeathed him. The elder King Frederick William was fascinated with all things military, but unfortunately his reign coincided with a long outbreak of peace. He and the mighty army he created never had a chance to go to war. Frederick William was responsible for many military innovations, some still in use today. He introduced the idea of a permanent, fully paid, professional army, instead of using mercenaries. Die Fahne bei den Fuß. He gave his soldiers uniforms in Prussian blue, so they could recognize each other in the heat of battle. Ramrods were made of iron instead of wood, cutting down on breakages on the battlefield and increasing firing speed. But perhaps the greatest innovation was the rediscovery of Roman battle theories. Frederick William drilled his soldiers to march in step so they could move over the battlefield quickly. Previously, armies ambled along, having to stop and wait for stragglers. Marching together meant the infantry could move and fire simultaneously, and the ominous din of thousands of boots marching together terrified the enemy. Eventually, Frederick William's military interests developed into a bizarre obsession. He began to collect tall soldiers, drafting very big men from all over Europe to join a regiment of giants. All over six feet, and some nearer seven, they were pampered, well-paid symbols of Frederick William's Prussian military might. Too valuable to be actually used in combat, the regiment was no more than ceremonial. And even the king had to look up at his own giant soldiers, for he was just over five feet tall. Frederick William sought manly pursuits, preferring to drink and discuss military tactics with his beloved soldiers. The king despised the arts. Theatres are the temples of Satan. Professing to be a deeply moral man, he was obsessed with faithfulness and chastity. Harlotry is the most terrible sin. The King of Prussia openly loathed intellectuals, musicians, bureaucrats, foreigners, Jews, Jesuits, and the French. He cultivated the masculine pleasures of drinking, smoking, hunting, and sharing lewd jokes with his tall soldiers. Despite Frederick William's professed manliness, he was not averse to seeking comfort in the arms of his faithful giant soldiers. If women weren't available, he would gladly waltz with a grenadier. The most beautiful girl would be a matter of indifference to me. But tall soldiers, they are my weakness. He who sends me tall soldiers can do with me whatever he likes. Cecilio Bertini. Eins, zwei, drei. Einer für mich bist mir noch schuldig. Nächster. Patrick O'Connor. Eins, zwei, drei. Frederick William raised money to pay for his military obsession by selling the crown jewels and 20 of his 25 royal palaces. He also cut down on servants, obliging the queen to do her own washing. These miserly actions made Prussia the laughing stock of Europe. But his stinginess was actually a calculated plan 
to mask the king's construction of a powerful war machine. In a final letter to his son, Frederick William wrote, Only under the guise of these spectacular eccentricities was I allowed to gather a large treasury and assemble a powerful army. Now this money and these troops lie at the disposal of my successor, who requires no such mask. Fritz, think what I tell you. Always maintain a good and large army. Frederick William's son and heir grew up in the shadow of his father's overbearing attitude and military obsession. The son, who was to become Frederick the Great, was a man of contradictions. Inside the body of a warrior beat the heart of a sensitive musician and philosopher. A talented flautist and composer, the younger Frederick even wrote military marches. Frederick ascended to the throne after his father's death in 1740. Europe expected the young king would reduce his father's army and pursue an artistic life. But Frederick had other plans. Within weeks, he sent his troops into Austria in an unprovoked attack and unleashed 23 years of European war. The Prussian army dominated the battlefields as Frederick proved a dynamic and fearless leader. And after two decisive victories, Frederick became known as the Great. Most generals still observed gentlemanly military etiquette, scheduling battles to begin after breakfast. But Frederick launched surprise attacks a tactic unheard of in the polite world of European warfare. His father's innovation of lockstep marching made for a fast-moving army, enabling Frederick to carry out maneuvers other generals would never have dared, such as splitting his army to outflank the enemy or sending his cavalry uphill to take higher ground. Fighting both the French and Austrian armies at the same time, the pinnacle of Frederick's military career came in 1757. Though he was outnumbered two to one, he marched against the French at Rossbach. Because of his father's innovations, the Prussian army was able to fire six rounds a minute, three times faster than their opponents. In addition, Frederick realized the enemy regiments were made up of foreign mercenaries. Without a common language, they could easily be thrown into disarray by unconventional tactics. Within three hours, the Prussians killed or captured 16,000 enemy, while losing only 500 of their own troops. Frederick next turned his attention to his other enemies, the Austrians. They thought Frederick would withdraw and regroup, but instead, Frederick advanced. Moving with astonishing speed, the Prussian army caught the Austrians unawares at the Battle of Leuten and quickly routed them. In the space of less than a month, Frederick had defeated the two most powerful nations in Europe. Frederick the Great's battle tactics were so brilliant, they are still taught today in military academies. Between military campaigns, Frederick withdrew to his beloved palace, Sans Souci, which means without a care. Here, he could forget about war and indulge his creative spirit. The French writer Voltaire and the German composer Bach were frequent visitors at his court. Presiding over gatherings of intellectuals and artists, Frederick the Great earned himself another title, the Philosopher King. 
he took up music again, and his compositions were highly regarded. Spain used one of Frederick's tunes as its national anthem for over 50 years, and his flute sonatas are still regularly performed today. His literary output was prolific. He once completed a 36-volume history of the church while besieging a town in Silesia. Here, in Frederick's personal library, are some of the thousands of verses, epic poems, political testaments and military histories he wrote during his long reign. Every single word in French. Frederick felt his own language lacked subtlety and was coarse and vulgar. Not one book in this priceless collection is written in German. But the European battleground exploded once again and Frederick was soon back on the front lines. By now, the rest of Europe realized the only way to defeat Prussia was to form an alliance against Frederick the Great. This time, Frederick and his army met their match. Austria and Russia defeated the Prussian forces at the Battle of Kunersdorf in 1759. Frederick lost 19,000 soldiers killed or captured. With the rest of his troops scattered in all directions, he contemplated suicide. My coat is riddled with musket balls, and I've had two horses killed under me. It is my misfortune that I am still alive. Our losses are very great. I have only 3,000 men left from 48,000. I shall not survive this cruel turn of fortune. I believe that everything is lost. I shall not outlive the downfall of my country. Farewell forever. But his enemies failed to capitalize on their victories and allowed Frederick to regroup. In the political confusion that followed, the alliance against Prussia split apart. Prussia emerged victorious, but at huge cost. During the 23 years of conflict, over half a million Prussians had been killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. Frederick the Great lived out the last 20 years of his life at Sans Souci, without a care. With no more battles to fight, he was content to savor his past glory, his music, art, and philosophy. But remembering his father's advice, he kept his army in a constant state of readiness, just in case. Before he died in 1786, he predicted, Let me tell you how it will be after my death. There will be merriment at court. My successor will squander the treasure and allow the army to degenerate. His women will then govern, and the state will go to rack and ruin. Frederick's gloomy prediction proved correct. Twenty years later, the proud Prussian army, built and trained by King Frederick William, battle-tested by his son, Frederick the Great, once again met the French at the Battle of Jena. And the entire might of the Prussian army was defeated in a single day by yet another great warmonger, Napoleon Bonaparte. Prussian Frederick the Great was a gifted artist as well as a mighty warrior. His father, King Frederick William, was an eccentric military innovator, while English King Richard the Lionheart was in love with bloodlust as much as war. Intelligent, inventive, or just vicious, history remembers them all as warmongers. <laughs> <laughs>